Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationships. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships, How can relationships evolve, evolve with people evolve as they grow and change? Grow and change? Welcome to the Curious Folks Podcast. For those challenging the status quo in love, sex, and relationships. My name is Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Misla. And today we're excited to speak with Jessica Fern about her book, Polysecure. I cannot tell you how many times over the past three months, a friend, a client, a colleague has asked me, have you heard about this book called Polysecure? I finally did and I consumed it and I took a ton of notes and am just thrilled that we had an opportunity to do a deep dive in this topic with this author. Jessica Fern is a psychotherapist, a public speaker, and a trauma and relationship expert. In her international private practice, Jessica works with individuals, couples, and people in multi-partner relationships who no longer want to be limited by their reactive patterns, cultural conditioning, insecure attachment styles, and past traumas, helping them to embody new possibilities in life and love. Our regular listeners have heard us talk about attachment theory on many episodes. Although Jessica talks through the different attachment styles in this episode, for a more comprehensive look into the topic, I recommend listening to episode 24 with Angie Gunn and episode 45 to get an overview of attachment theory. You can also jump on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash wearecuriousfoxes to listen to my talk about attachment theory and how it shows up in adult relationships at the Consider This conference. You can also read about the intersection of attachment theory and sexuality on the Curious Fox blog. Check out our articles titled How Attachment Patterns Impact Our Sexual Experience and Attachment and Sexuality. Be More Connected. British psychologist John Bowlby, who established attachment theory, defined attachment as a lasting psychological connectedness between human beings. Our attachment styles are the culmination of our emotional landscape and behavioral strategies that serve to achieve or maintain proximity with our attachment figures. In layman's terms, it's about how we feel and behave when we feel close to someone. There are four different attachment styles. A secure attachment style is when we feel relationships are important to us, but they do not form our sense of self. Folks with a secure attachment system can flow in between and tolerate being close and apart from loved ones with ease. They feel they can trust others and feel worthy of love. Anxious ambivalent attachment is often characterized by being clingy or needy in relationships. Folks with an anxious ambivalent attachment are often preoccupied with seeking and ensuring closeness and chronically worry about the integrity of the relationship. Anxious avoidant or dismissive avoidant attachment is often characterized by being aloof or non-committal in relationships. Folks with an anxious avoidant attachment style tend to struggle with closeness and intimacy and often talk about feeling trapped or claustrophobic in relationships. Disorganized or disoriented attachment is often characterized as being chaotic or dramatic in relationships. These folks may seek closeness while pushing people away at the same time. This organized or disoriented attachment style is often caused by developmental trauma to do with our original caregivers, often our parents or parental figures. There are two ways of thinking about attachment styles. The most current and the most flexible way of looking at attachment styles is through a two-axis model, where on axis X, we consider how we feel about ourselves. And it ranges from, I'm worthy and I deserve to be loved, to, I'm not worthy and I don't deserve love. On the y-axis, we consider how we feel about others. This axis goes from, other people are okay and safe and will be open to loving me, to, other people are unsafe and will reject me. Depending on which quadrant you find yourself at a specific time in a specific relationship, you'll show up as having a specific attachment style. Please note a couple of things. This is a super simplification of the attachment theory. 
Attachment theory offers a rich source of insight and self-awareness, so I encourage everyone to look into it. Also, attachment styles aren't static. They are not who we are, they're not a part of our identity. They can change, shift, and heal. In Polysecure, Jessica extends attachment theory into the realm of non-monogamy. She uses her nesting model of attachment and trauma to expand our understanding of how emotional experiences can influence our relationships. Breaking away from the often hetero and mononormative paths toward secure attachment, Jessica sets out six specific strategies to help you move toward secure attachment in multiple relationships. Polysecure is both a practical guide and an important thought piece on how we can understand but not be confined by our attachment styles. Polysecure is hands down the most contemporary and relevant book I read about polyamory and attachment theory. And this was an incredible conversation. We hope you enjoyed the interview. It's important to name the fact that the narrative around non-monogamy and attachment has been limited from the start, which is part of what your your book was trying to fill in. And so for many years, non-monogamy was discussed in relationship either to couples who are opening up as a part or as a part of a subculture like kink or swinging or relationship anarchy. And so I'm wondering, when did it occur to you that single folks and auxiliary partners were not a part of that conversation? I mean, it first occurred to me just with couples in my office and me me trying to help them make sense of like, what the hell is going on, (laughs) right? Like, especially for the couples that like genuinely want to do this. But then the couple where you have the pairing of one wants to do it because they feel this is their orientation, the other one's not sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then it was probably more in just my own experience of being non-monogamous and seeing what was happening to the people who weren't in the primary partnership. And why that was hard sometimes, their needs, what was happening with attachment, Mm -hmm. right? And then just as I would have clients that were also solo polyamorous, like, oh, this is happening. Like, Mm -hmm. there's attachment needs here as well. That's been our experience as well, is that so much of the conversation has been focused on protecting the couple and the couple's agreements and the couple's narrative and couple privilege and all the other folks whose feelings are also a part of that process felt like secondary characters to the narrative plot of the two protagonists who are moving through this adventure together. And so... I do think that not only in, in your in your work, and we'll talk through this, not only do you talk about the importance of, of attachment within the relationship, but you talk about that as it relates to oneself. And frankly, that's yeah. what we all need to be starting anyway, is, is that work within ourselves. I also think, you know, as I, there's so much of an emphasis on jealousy in the non-monogamous communities, and it's very important, the thing that's real and comes up, but the, it wasn't sufficient to describe what was happening. Like a lot of what I was seeing as attachment and security or ruptures were being labeled as jealousy. And it was like, that's not working here as, mm. as a way to understand this and as a way to work with this. Yes, I think you're absolutely right, both within the non-monogamous polyamorous communities and those who are interested. The thing that I hear a lot is, what about jealousy? It's with, it's probably the, the one yeah. of the top three questions. What about jealousy? And often the way that I describe it to people is that jealousy is like, it's a big ball of something. It's a message. It's an alarm. It's not really in itself anything. It's telling you to look deeper. It's telling you to look within, without, to to sort of really understand. There's, it's essentially telling you something is wrong. Something is wrong. And you have to sort of dig, dig in to find out what is it for you. And I think when you do, everybody actually experiences jealousy from a different place. Mm. And, and, and almost di- also differently the, when I hear you say that, that's kind of what comes up for me. Yeah, I agree. I also see it as a messenger, like what is jealousy trying to tell us? And then it's pointing to the root. So I use this little, is it coming from me, we, or society, mm. right? And looking at, right, is the jealousy just purely my own, whether it's insecure attachment or my own insecurity and comparison about myself or my projections onto others? That has nothing to do with my partner. Or is it a we? Like, yeah, my partner is not keeping agreements or they made promises and they're giving those things to someone else and not me, right? That feels, that's not just jealousy, right? Like that's relationship neglect. Or society of just, there's many things around, you know, 
the gender binary, how men and women are socialized and conditioned and what it means to be a man or a woman, right? In air quotes, what love means that, you know, the idea that if you don't really love someone, then you're not, wait, what is it like? Your jealousy is a sign of commitment or true love, right? So there's right. all these mm. like, you know, discourses and narratives that can also be influencing our personal experience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That if you don't feel jealousy, that you can't really be in love. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I remember I felt that way regarding territorialism. So Effie and I, the way we came together was she was my relationship coach. And so my marriage was in the struggle after practicing opening up. And I remember we, at the time we were talking about hierarchy and I was saying like, there can be others, but I have to be the one. And I remember Effie and, and my wife at the time being, but, but why though? But why? And I'm like, because that's what it is. Like, I can't even right. understand why you're asking me that question. And they're like, that's society. I'm like, no, that's, that's just my truth. And then of course, now I have another partner. We split our time. It's not hierarchical. Like right. all those things are true. But at the time that societal message so seeped into the way I was thinking about my relationship, that even though I was the one that initiated our, our non-monogamous kind of adventure, I was also the one that was saying, but wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I still have to be the one amongst the others. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I also love what you're saying about me, me, we, or society. Because I think we've also come to believe that our insecure attachment is a direct result of the way the way in which our caregivers raised us, right? We really take it to the, the household and to the very, very nuclear experience in the developmental years. Um, in your book, you outline a number of other factors that contribute to attachment style that has, you know, not directly to do with our caregivers. I created the nested model of attachment and trauma just for that reason to sort of expand and flush out. It's not just attachment, how it shows up with ourselves, like what's your attachment style or how it shows up in relationship, you know, whether as adults or from the experiences we had with our parents or caretakers. But yeah, how our experience of home and community and society and the global levels all can impact our attachment whether it's creating ruptures or actually being a form of healing of our attachment. Yeah. As, and I know you are a parent as well. And so I, I share, hopefully, I imagine you share this. That felt like a lot of pressure, like like understanding attachment as a yeah. parent at every moment. I'm like, I'm doing it somehow right yes. now. <laughs> right now I'm messing you up and I don't even know how. Yes. <laughs> and so that did feel like relief when reading your work and saying, okay, it's not all on the parents. Totally. Yeah. I think my first parent meltdown was like probably just a few months into my son being born. And I was just so isolated. And I just was like, I can't, I'm supposed to be this entire village. And I like, can't, like, yes. I literally can't, you know, and I know all these things about what this baby needs for secure attachment, but like one, two people cannot do all of this. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's actually something that we talk about often, which is the other question along with the jealousy that I hear in the top top five is, what about the children? You know, when we talk <laughs> yeah. about polyamory, it's the other one. And and I think, um, you know, a well fun a well functioning, thriving, well adjusted polycule, or or I, I like to think of them as micro communities, which I think that's kind of what, yeah. what it becomes can actually provide that village. And and time and again, we see kids coming out of those environments to be better adjusted, have a higher um, emotional intelligence, feel sec more secure, and all those kind of things. Because to your point, it's really hard for a nuclear, the, the modern nuclear family to be a village, to yeah. give the child the variety, the trust, the, the experiences that, that, that they need to come into themselves, to be fully self-expressed. Yeah, exactly. Right, the challenges of... I'm trying to just meet the basic physical, emotional needs, but then I can't also be like the playmate and the entertainment and all these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, whenever it's about polyamory and the kids, I point to Elizabeth Sheff's work. Yes. Right? Yes. Phenomenal. If people don't know, go check out Elizabeth Sheff's work on the longitudinal studies of kids raised in polyamorous families. And they're doing great. The kids are all right. The kids are doing well. Yeah, exactly. The kids are. <laughs> yeah, we we've had her a, a few times. We had her as a as an educator, as a speaker, as on on the podcast a couple of times. Um, and you know that's exactly. She's like the, the kids are doing great. 
<laughs> you know, you need to figure out the adults. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the adults, right? It's exactly. The adults exactly. There. Well, I think part of what's happening now too, and why we're having these awarenesses is, is more and more people. So attachment theory was something that was not as well known and now is becoming part of the, the common vernacular now. And, and people are getting hip to attachment styles and are working towards secure attachment. You know, there's a, a, a I think a TikTok somewhere or something that says like the three things that you can whisper in someone's ear that they're going to be excited about is I'm in therapy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so there, there's this really this shift to like, we should be working on ourselves and we should be thinking about yeah. that. And you say attachment style is a new sexy. I'm wondering if that's what you mean. Yeah. Or secure attachment is the new sexy. <laughs> yes. I have this vision that we on dating apps will note like our, our style or like attachment style with like emoji. Like there'll be either like a turtle or an <laughs> octopus or maybe like a tornado <laughs> or emoji. Yeah. So like a, like I want to know that, you know, I want to know you're working on it. I want to know. So like, will it match? And I also think that that idea reinforces that attachments are who yeah. we are. Right. And I know that attachments are looked at like Zodiac signs or Myers-Briggs, like a label with characteristics that you cannot escape. And you say in the book, which I think is beautiful, that finding names for what we feel and experience can be a relief. And it can also confine us or obscure the fullness of who we are, conflating the label from who we are as a person without the option to change. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, about this idea of changing and also earned secure attachment, which you Mm -hmm. talk about in your book. Well, so right, many people, they come across the attachment styles and like Myers-Briggs or their astrology, you know, they learn about their moon sign or whatever. And it's such a relief because it's like, oh, I'm getting a description of me. I'm not the only one, you know, and especially with attachment styles, it puts, can put your whole history into context in a way that's just like, oh, thank you. This makes sense now, right? I'm not broken. But then the other end of that is it can go too far into a rigid typology as if, well, then therefore this is how I am, who I am forever and always, right? And that is not true. Like attachment styles are not static. Um, All the research shows that they do change. And so they can even change within the insecure styles (laughs) from partner to partner, relationship to relationship, or even within the same relationship over time. We can go from being more avoidant to more anxious. Um, and vice versa. But the wonderful news is like, yeah, we can all have our insecure attachment, you know, and we can do that inner work with ourselves and within, you know, our relationships to be more insecure functioning. Yeah, I think that that feels incredibly comforting, both that there is language around something that I can say, oh, this is what's happening and this is why. And also that I can do the work to develop secure attachment and not feel trapped in this place of constantly either seeking out or pushing away in order to keep myself safe. And knowing also that not all of the ways that we are that we relate to others within our relationship are a result of our attachment style. You know, the one thing that you you talk about is that we have to look at intention versus behavior. And I think that also comes with pathologizing attachment styles and saying, oh, well, clearly it's a commitment issue, right? The fact that you don't want to, to be in a relationship and you want to just go to play parties or clearly. And I think that that awareness around, let's look at the intention apart from the behavior is an important observation. And right. And what you're getting at is the mainstream attachment literature would start to look at things like sexting, having multiple partners, uh, having casual sex, having sex outside of your primary relationship as insecure attachment behaviors. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. (laughs) You know, yes, maybe some people with insecure styles are doing those things. But right, what's the intention, right? Because for many people, those same behaviors are not an expression of their insecure attachment style. One of the things that I loved about your book that I think helps is is with this particular piece, right? Of knowing whether you whether you behaving out of a a, you know an attachment style, uh, an insecure attachment style versus just how you roll is the um, the statements that you um, assign to each style. Like they might say things like, and I thought that was really helpful. I use a similar model in my coaching, just you know if if things get a little complicated and I want to kind of help 
figure out where everybody is. It, you know, I will say statements and be like, does that, does this resonate with you? Or does this resonate with you? And I think um, having having a description of what it is and then the phrases that that people use, sometimes verbatim, you know, like you see <laughs> right. the same people saying the same thing and you're like, whoa, that's crazy, you know? Um, right. But super helpful because it really gets you to sort of put like helps you put context to things and you can really self audit and you're like oh yeah like I think about this or I say this out loud all the time so that I thought was right. really helpful oh good I'm glad <laughs> yeah I have a question you say in your work and we know that attachment styles can shift and we can go towards yeah. healing we can always move, do work to go towards a secure attachment style I'm curious what do you think are the motivators to get people to kind of one recognize and take note of their attachment style and then figure out what the work is and do that work towards a secure attachment style especially for those who are, tend to be more on the avoidance side what do you think are the motivators that will encourage people towards healing? I mean, usually the motivator is suffering, right? Is relationship hardship, relationships falling apart, relationships not working, finding yourself in the same pattern, right? And there's only so many times you can keep blaming your partners for the same thing that keeps showing up in your life. So I think that's usually what is the initial motivation, you know, is that many of us aren't pushed to grow and unless we're uncomfortable, right? Unless we're like, there's a huge discrepancy between what I want and what I'm experiencing, mm. right? And so that usually is the most powerful motivator, you know? And yet, of course, there's people who are just, you know, relationship geeks, <laughs> self-help <laughs> geeks, right? And they just want to keep growing and they find the new thing and they go, ooh, let's look mm-hmm. at this, right? But I think the majority of the time people come to it because they're just like, what do I do here? Right. I'm at my edge. I'm at my limit. Do you think that there's a correlation between attachment style and one's propensity towards non-monogamy or even maybe the correlation between the attachment style and how one engages in non-monogamy? Yeah, I think it's more the latter because the, the first part is, is a slippery question, Mm -hmm. right? Because, because you're, you're using it right of correlation. But when we talk about that, so many people want to insert causation, Mm. right? And so many people want to say, oh, you're non-monogamous because you're insecurely attached. And the research shows that is not true. When they compare people who are monogamous and non-monogamous, that non-monogamous people tend to be just as secure and sometimes even more secure, right? Mm. So that's the Mm. good news. And then I also say like a lot of people with insecure attachment styles just are going to want nothing to do with non-monogamy actually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just going to exacerbate the whole thing, right? Whichever direction you are, right? So yeah, I want to be careful of like, I don't, I don't think it's that our attachment styles cause Mm -hmm. us to be monogamous or non-monogamous. However, when we are non-monogamous, the way we express our non-monogamy is different depending on our attachment mm-hmm. style. Same thing as the way we express our monogamy is going to look different depending on attachment mm-hmm. style. So people who are more preoccupied, anxious, and they're non-monogamous, um, they are. They're going to have maybe more, bigger expressions of jealousy, more of that experience of the primal panic that I talk about in the book. Um, this would be the same for the disorganized, fearful, avoidance style. They might want to grasp more onto hierarchy, right? And maintaining primary ship as a way of being secure. Yet that doesn't mean that hierarchy is an expression of insecure attachment, right? Mm-hmm. But that's what probably happens, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to want to really probably... A lot of times the preoccupied, anxious, like wants to know their metamor, wants to know the details, wants to get involved. Right? <laughs> You're like, describing all of my things. Yes. Keep going. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Take it like check, check. Uh-huh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereas someone who's more on the avoidant dismissive, my, I don't want to know the details. I don't want to know about that. Right. Go do whatever. Don't tell me. Or um, so they might be more likely to, you know, Uh, request the don't ask, don't tell experience, right? Or they might not really, they might want more parallel poly instead of kitchen table poly. They might be drawn to solo polyamory because it keeps people, it can keep people more at a comfortable arm's length, right? Or they might be more inclined to want more casual sex than people who are in 
you know, the other attachment styles. And again, casual sex, solo polyamory is an insecure attachment, but people with that might go, Ooh, that fits, right? That, that maintains my attachment style without challenging it so much. Yeah. I notice a lot of compartmentalization happens around there. Mm-hmm. A lot of um, mm-hmm. boxes, relationships, people in boxes, not often touching or interacting. But and I find that sometimes it generalizes, like those people tend to compartmentalize more in general. I don't know if that aligns with your experience. Yeah, the avoidant dismissive. Yeah, absolutely. And it can be leveraged as a skill because in non-monogamy, there, we do need the ability to mm-hmm. compartmentalize and go, yes. okay, I just had that experience with this person. Now I'm coming home to this person and I need to shelf it. You know, I can't just jump and have no boundaries from one relationship to the next. But yes, there can be the over compartmentalization where things are too separate or a lot of complaints that people have when they're partnered with someone in the avoidant style is like they're not getting enough information that is actually necessary, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like you're leaving really important details. And that person, it's not like they're intentionally leaving them out. They're just like, oh, it doesn't even occur to me that I should share this. Right. I notice a um, a super high tolerance to ambiguity is kind of what the way that I kind of Mm -hmm. sort of label it, I guess. It's like Mm -hmm. the the ambiguity just seems to be just sit well with them. You know, they don't need more information. They don't want more information. They don't want to give more information. They seem to be comfortable with this like very murky, um, like a very murky state. Yeah, right. Of maybe not wanting labels as much or, yeah, more comfortable without labels. Yeah, you were describing my partners perfectly now. Now I'm like, check, check, check on that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes, exactly. (laughs) So disorganized doesn't have one coherent expression. That's why it is disorganized, right? So it can look more like the preoccupied, anxious. It can look like more the avoidant, dismissive, vacillate back and forth, right? And so, and yet, as you said, it's, it's coming from someone who's gone through trauma. Right. And so there we're going to see in non-monogamy more activation of triggers, more activation of primal panic, you know, situations that might seem neutral to certain people can be very triggering and activating to someone who's in this style and hasn't yet, you know, processed through their traumas, right. And processed through the style. Yeah. And you see it within certain, um, polycules or non-monogamous communities where there can be these, like, like you said, tornadoes, right? These tornadoes of experiences, this drama, these meltdowns, these explosions, you know, this, this back and forth, the disorganized might have a lot of back and forth that happens. And that can be really hard for everyone involved. Yeah, for sure. I think I, that's kind of where I was. I think I'm somebody who I would like to say arrived at, but on my way, continuously on my way to earn secure, um, earn secure attachment through um, the disco- disorganized path. I think it's important to make room for that because I think that's where the trauma piece comes in. I think this is where we need to sort of encourage people, urge people towards finding a path to healing those um, early traumas so that there's hope towards um, a secure attachment. Yeah. And sort of bridge that to sort of the other question, right, is, is knowing, okay, which style or styles, because we can be experiencing more than one, are struggling and, and what does the relationship, how can the relationship support some of that, right? So in its essence, the fearful avoidant is like searching for, am I safe? The anxious is like, am I loved and valued, <laughs> right? And the, usually the um, dismissive is, is there space for me? right? Am I free? And so how can we bowl all dialogue of what are those attachment needs that you're ex- experiencing? And how does this relationship support that for each of us, even if they on the surface seem to be in competition, they're actually not, you know, and there's ways to say, okay, how do I help support you in feeling more safe? How do I help support you in feeling more valued and loved and seen? How do I help support your freedom, but not at the expense of what I need, right? So. I appreciate you narrowing it down so specifically that way to those questions, because I do think that's really helpful. I think that as you're describing that out, 
not only does it relate to my experience, but I think as I'm thinking about the conversations that we've had with guests and foxes and folks on the podcast, that just asking as a part of your inventory, either with yourself, as a part of the exploration in the beginning of a relationship, as a part of your relationship check-in over time, just to continue to check in on those pieces and say, how am I feeling now? And not assume that you're always, to your point, going to be stuck there, that at some point, maybe feeling safe was what I wanted, but now freedom is what I need and making room for that conversation. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like attachment radars or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Jessica, do you think that there are people with certain attachment styles thrive more so in open structures than others? Yeah, secure. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. <that. laughs> yeah. <laughs> when someone, right, it's like so simple. But yeah, when someone's in secure attachment with themselves, I mean, I think that's what's really needed to do the open structure and feel like it is supportive and liberating, right? Instead mm-hmm. of really difficult and traumatic, right? Is is we need to feel that inner sense of security and that I have the relationship security that I need to whatever degree that relationship is at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm thinking of a client of mine who would identify herself as disorganized and she had gone through pretty severe relationship abuse, like pretty bad, two relationships long-term. And so for her, a part of her healing was actually being non-monogamous. So she didn't have to not have intimacy in her life at all, but she didn't have to merge with those people in the way those previous Mm -hmm. abusive codependent relationships Mm -hmm. were, right? Mm -hmm. So it gave her an opportunity to say, okay, I can diffuse my attachment over two or three partners and not do what I've done in the past and yet not mm-hmm. not have sex or love, you know, mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then she's inched in. I mean, in the last year now, she's like feeling more secure with two of these partners mm-hmm. and not in the disorganized style, right? Mm-hmm. And then make different relationship decisions with them. It's, it's So I really saw her use that, the non-monogamy to her advantage in her healing. In her healing. Yeah, no, it's, it makes sense. It, it makes me think of people who use kink to help um, heal from any kind of sexual trauma because it's a, yes. a control environment and um, gives them an outlet to, to process some stuff. So I can totally see how that would work um, in relationships as well. And on that note, actually, I'm curious, given a lot of uh, the attachment conversation is rooted in family dynamics, right? Yeah. Um, society as well, we talked about it, but a lot of it is in family dynamics, which are by design non-sexual environments, right? So I'm curious to how, you, how do you think the, this blueprint of attachment translates to adult relationship where there is room and desire for the erotic? Right. And that's the transition. Right. Because in the parent child relationship, ideally, there is not a sexual component. Mm. Right. And that it is more of a unidirectional parent is there to meet the attachment needs of the child. And the, the parent is attached as well. Right. But the adult transition is sort of those two things is now it's reciprocal. We're both meeting mm. each other's attachment needs. And then usually, unless we're talking about someone on the sort of asexual spectrum, that sexuality is included in our attachment and even an expression of our attachment. All the different styles have different ways of their attachment influencing how they do sex. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah. So usually the, uh, well, so the secure is sort of that, as I, we joked earlier, like secure is the new sexy. So people who are in secure attachment style in their relationship, they feel safe. They can speak up. They care about consent. They can set their boundaries. They can say no. They can ask for what they want. There's that secure base happening where it's like, ooh, let's play. Let's explore. Oop, we're kind of getting caught in our sex scripts. Let's try on some new sex scripts, you know, like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's just a lot more like comfort and freedom and that range that's happening. The dismissive is going to sort of have less of that emotional intimacy in their sexuality, right? And they may not want that. They might not want to make eye contact. They might not want to, you know, say sweet, loving things, even though they might love their partner, like that might be really uncomfortable for them in sex. Or they might just want more casual, disconnected sex and sex for the act of sex, 
versus the way sex can also include the emotional or the spiritual for other people. The preoccupied is going to grasp onto sex to know that I am safe and secure in this relationship. So a lot of preoccupied folks folks might have sex before they really want just to sort of like nail things down. Seal the deal. (laughs) Seal the deal. Exactly. (laughs) And that can cause a lot of issues within that relationship. They might be not say yes or no, and they mean yes or no. So they might be, you know, engaging in acts that aren't really fulfilling for them, or they're doing things more to please their partner, which is, it's great to want to please our partner, but at the expense of maybe knowing about their own pleasure and, Mm -hmm. and asking for things around their own pleasure. In this one relationship, a male and female, his love language is actually really sex, right? More than the others. And so for her, who's a little bit more anxious, if a week went by without sex, she just started to lose it, even though that wasn't her love language necessarily. To her, it was the sign of, uh uh-oh, things are horrible. Mm -hmm. So things like that would show up. And, you know, disorganized can look like either one of those. Kink can show up in any of the styles. I want that to be really clear. And sort of as you had mentioned, though, for people that maybe have a history of trauma, they might be drawn to kink as a way to heal that. And it can be a profound way to reclaim and heal their sexuality. Yeah, no, that's all, all of that makes so much sense. I have an endless string of clients who want to open up their sexless marriages in pursuit of, you know, the erotic elsewhere. And yeah. when questioned, uh, they confess that they never had a thri- thriving sex life in, ever. In the first place. In the first place, yeah. And, um, and, and they say they never thought it would be important, that they didn't think that they would they'll just figure it out or it'll happen or they just, it wasn't important that it wouldn't have an impact down the line. Do you believe that's connected to people looking for caregivers as partners or do you think that is to do with the attachment style? I think it has to do with a lot of things. Cause when I see partners, like you're saying, they want to open up their marriage um, because it's a sexless marriage. I want to know, well, why? Mm -hmm. Right. And are you actually okay with this? If both partners are genuinely okay with it, where they're like, yeah, we're just not a good match. And yet we don't want to disassemble our life. We love our family or we love our home. And like, they're genuinely okay, then it can work. But when you have sort of our marriage is sexless because one partner isn't attracted to the other one anymore. And the Mm -hmm. other one is like, oh, that's going to get really tricky. Right. Or that's not the reason you open up Mm -hmm. is we actually address what's going on. Or a lot of times what I see is, um, if you're familiar with the erotic blueprint. Yes. So, right. We have just different sex styles and people Mm. don't know that, right? They don't Mm. know, oh, one of you is more energetic and the other is more sexual and great. So maybe find other partners that fit your style better, but also there's a way to bridge the gap in your sexuality together. So it doesn't have to be just a mismatch all the time. But yes, yeah, some people want to open up because it's a way to avoid having the difficult conversations in the relationship. <laughs> you know, that does happen. I don't think that's the main reason people are opening up at all. But yes, I do see that happen. And the irony, of course, is that that process will illuminate every challenge and exactly, difficulty right. and, and hard conversation. Yeah, because I think that in the beginning of, of a relationship, people's attachment styles either may not be obvious uh, or may not create tension because people are caught up in in new relationship energy. They're just getting to know each other. But then over time, their style and possibly conflict then will emerge. Effie has referred to that as like putting the floodlights on because the at first it's like dim lit and beautiful and romantic. And then it's like, we're going to open up and the floodlights come on and every cobweb is is shown. Yeah. Right. And then the floodgates open, right? To use both metaphors. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. The floodlights open the floodgates. Yes. (laughs) Essentially, it's a design. Disaster. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's also true. And you reference this too when in the beginning of an opening up process, if, if folks are, are paired or coupled, is that it moves from doing things together. Like we're opening up together. We're going through this process together. Maybe there was kink or, or sex parties or swinging involved that led to now this, this part of the journey. And then it moves to separate experiences. Yeah. And that then can be really challenging because we were holding hands along this process and then we let go. And you now you're dating all these people and I'm not, or you're having sex and 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 that can create some tension there and I'm wondering if you've experienced that with your clients 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think this is one of the attachment ruptures that even happens is you have a couple, like you're saying, it's even before the opening up, it's just like, oh, you're my confident. You know everything that goes on in my day. We text throughout the day. <laughs> like, you know, you're the person I share everything with. There's no separation. And that's not always good, but it's what they were used to. And that's what the status quo has been and what's comfortable. And then you open up and it's like, oh, I can't process all of this with you. It's not appropriate, you know, to tell you about my other partner's details. Or me telling you about my new sexual experience triggers the hell out of you. And it's not, right? We're not the people anymore that we can tell everything to. And so I think yeah. that becomes the attachment rupture, right? And it's actually yeah. a rupture of engulfment to differentiation that's often needed, mm-hmm. right? But it can feel like a huge loss for folks. Yeah. When I experienced that with my clients, the um, the support that I, the support that I suggest to them is um, to connect to a community, mm. to a broader community. Find your local poly community, open community. Find other folks who are going through transition, and they're just like your finances, diversify your support network. <laughs> <laughs> is my is my advice. Uh, financial and emotional advice, diversify. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, what um, is, does, does that resonate with you? And what mm-hmm. other what other tools, ideas that you might want to suggest to people to help with that transition? Yeah, that's exactly. I'll say connect in whether it's in person or online, pre or post pandemic or during. Right, get connected to communities, but actually just make poly friends, right? Because a lot of times people Mm -hmm. open up and their only poly connections are their partners or people that they're messaging on dating app. Mm -hmm. And that gets sticky too, because you don't want to be turning to that person to process what's happening in the other relationship necessarily, Mm -hmm. right? So get poly friends, get a poly professional, whether Mm -hmm. coach, therapist, right? Get your safe place that you can really just process this with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whether it's an online forum, you know, a meetup or one on one. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. I'm wondering if you can talk about how those then in a non monogamous relationship can work towards secure attachment. We've talked about all the ways in which insecure attachment can show up in those spaces. And so you have outlined hearts and hearts as a way in which we can think about it. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit through that. Yeah. So that's in the book. That's part three of the book is like, okay, great. We talk about this stuff. Here's how do you do it? And hopefully it gives people enough of a context of the things they can do. And let me just backtrack to the point of hearts is like, here's the things you can do without me telling you to do monogamous behaviors. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's been the big problem with attachment stream literature is that maybe sometimes over half of the suggestions are things that only monogamous folks or nest or only nesting partners. Mm-hmm. Can do. And so here's things you can do regardless of whether you're living together or primary partners or not, you know, you can just do with a partner period. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And assuming first that you both want to be working on more of an attachment based relationship, right. Mm-hmm. Cause that's not what everyone wants or needs either. Right. So that's mm-hmm. the caveat, but working on just, basic presence, the quality of presence, you know, being here for each other and that felt sense that when we're together and even when we're apart, that I feel your presence, you know, emotionally or in my life or when we're together, it's mostly undivided attention that I get from you is really important. You're not distracted. You're not consumed with other relationships. You're not messaging other partners all the time other than, of course, there's times we need to do that too. E is express delight. So this is just that sense of feeling from each other that, wow, you're special, right? Like, wow, you're amazing to me. It's that attachment look, right? The eyes, the, this, the oozing from each other of just like, you matter, you know? Mm -hmm, And it mm -hmm. could be words of affirmation, um, but it's not just that. It's not that love language, right? With with my current husband, I remember, like, I need words of affirmation, but I'm not good at giving it, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, do you need me to get better at this? And he was like, no, your body tells me. Like, mm-hmm. the way you hug me, it's not even sexual. It's just the way you touch me, mm-hmm. the way you hug me. Like, my your body lets me know that 
you are delighting in my beingness, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the express delight is like, I love you for who you are, the how you be, so to speak, not what you do, not the accomplishments, checking of the boxes, the needs that you meet for me, the tasks you do for me. It's like just who you are. I love. I love that. A is attunement. So really being able to tune in emotionally, energetically to each ourselves and our partners, right? And it doesn't mean we have to agree, (laughs) right? Or necessarily even join them if they're sad that I have to be sad too, but I can tune in to, oh, I I noticed something's up, you know, can I be with you in this, right? Which is different Mm -hmm. than having to take it on. It's a quality too. It's a deepening of that presence where I'm just, I can be with you. This is huge in non-monogamy because there's so often that the reason our partner is triggered is because of something we did, right? Mm-hmm. Right, 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 another relationship, right? Mm-hmm. And so can I just tune into you almost like I would with a friend that can listen and just be with you in your upset mm-hmm. or discomfort without getting defensive, trying to fix it, trying to make it look at the bright side, you know, do all those other things Mm. or go into my own shame spiral. Oh, that I hurt you. That means I'm bad. R is uh, rituals and routines. So the importance of, yeah, what are the ways that we have like our little rituals of coming together and going or the certain special things that we do, the routines that we have, whether that's in person or through messaging, um, the bigger sort of rites of passage that we might want to go through together or ceremonies we might want to make together or transitions that we acknowledge. Right? Mm-hmm. That's really important mm-hmm. to our attachment mm-hmm. system. T is turning towards after conflict. So it's all about how do we manage you know, the conflict in relationship and not Mm -hmm. focus on there shouldn't be disconnection or ruptures, but there inevitably will be disconnection and ruptures Mm -hmm. in any relationship that is even secure. And how do we, Mm -hmm. you know, repair, right? And how do we embrace an attitude of humility, curiosity, and like open-hearted repair Mm -hmm. with our partners? Mm -hmm. And then S is secure attachment with self, where you do the hearts to yourself. Mm, Yeah. Yes. (laughs) I want to like have that written in in calligraphy and like put up on the wall because it is just so beautiful. I want a poster. I want a shirt. Yeah. 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 A sticker on my, on my, on my laptop just so that I see it all. (laughs) Yeah. Right. We talk about having the feelings chart, having nonviolent communication yeah. tips and tools, Scripts, like feelings yeah. and needs. And then this yeah. as well. Like, I think that these are like the triad of tools that we should have as reminders in front of us at all times. Amazing. I think it's also important to figure out what they, what these look like for you, like right. for the individual. Exactly. And so the book, you know, has questions and then things to experiment with under each of these letters, right? Both in relationship and then both with yourself, right? Of, okay, what does, what do you need to feel like your partners hear from you or that they're attuned? Or what does repair and apology need to look like for you? And it's going to look different with every pairing or tripling of people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you reference in your book how this research and this this project for you emerged both from your work with clients and realizing that there was a real information gap and there was a gap in tools yeah. for them to use, but then also for yourself and in your relationships and in your journey. And I'm wondering, yeah. you know, I think Effie and I, Effie and I can relate to those stories because it was our personal and professional journeys that brought us to this work as well. Yeah. We're like, there's a gap in the conversation, you know, this desire to like heal our own wounds through the process as well. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering how this has been for you personally in terms of applying these lessons and incorporating these things into your relationships? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, it's been great, you know, because in my marriage, which is a newer relationship, and I kind of wrote the book um, while we were together, but before we got married. And so there's been moments where, and he's listened to the book and, and we'll both be like, oh yeah, we're kind of slacking right now on some routines. Like we need, <laughs> like, you know, I'm feeling like, oh, we need more of that. Okay. Let's implement some gratitude practice right each night, you know, and it's been really helpful. Yeah. To have it even for myself to refer to as like, okay, I'm feeling a pull in my attachment system. Okay. Which of the hearts is it? you know, and to know where to go, 
whether it's things with myself I just need to focus on or things I need to look at. Yeah, this actually, I, I can imagine a marriage of the hearts model with um, Jackie's fuel gauge model, where you apply the fuel gauge to each of the... So, um, Jackie, do you want to speak briefly to your fuel gauge model? Sure. One of the pieces of, of things that I do within my work is like a fuel gauge with a car. Once you realize that your your gas tank is either full or empty, that folks can think about and assess the different areas that are important in their life or in their relationship mm-hmm. and determine, am I feeling full? Am I feeling more empty? And, and really then... And focusing their energy on that time. And so it sounds like that's what you're saying here is yes. to look at hearts and say, how full or empty are we in yes. this moment? Right. And yes. then it, it, uh, focus your attention on the places that need some, that, are, that there are gaps. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it just makes such a good reflection tool, both individually and within within the relationship with the other personal people. Um, it yeah. just makes for a really good reflection tool when you're doing your um, sort of regular check-ins, which is another thing that we talk about often, you know. Yeah. And to see, like, it's easy when something feels off to just focus on the problem. But sometimes you're like, oh, right, we're doing these three letters, like, really well. Let's celebrate that. Yeah. And then, yeah, these two letters more attention. Yes. Right. So yeah, I like that full or empty gauge. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Effie and I read a lot just because we're nerdy that way. And, you know, certainly for this work and truly, really just thoroughly enjoyed your book and in the work, I think the way that you've outlined it to um, give context and history to help people understand attachment theory, help people understand what the narrative was, help people rethink about that, help people then think through what that can mean in terms of application. At the end of the book, you go through some commonly asked questions and, and answer those as well. And so if you haven't already you should read it. If you read have book. read it, you should buy it for someone else in your <laughs> life because they need to read it because it really does now need to feel like something that's a part of our, our everyday conversation around for monogamous folks and mono- non-monogamous folks. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what I want to add in there. I think it's such an important book. Just like last week, we spoke to Angela Chen on her book um, called Ace, book about asexuality. And that book is also, it's for everyone. It's not for people who identify as being asexual. And I, I deeply feel this about your book, Polysecure. I think it is a good yeah. resource for anybody who's interested in relationships. It doesn't preach polyamory. It doesn't tell mm-hmm. you like non-monogamy is the only way. It definitely provides context for that because that, you know, there's some need for that. But I think, you know, I would say 85, 90% of the book is relevant to anybody who's in a relationship, who wants to be in a relationship, even if you're solo and you want to have a good relationship with yourself. I think it provides. So we talk about it, about polyamory and non-monogamy, but I think if you just want to have a better relationship with anybody and yourself, it is a great resource. Mm, thank you. I was hoping that would be the case, but didn't know if, how does it translate, right? So I'm glad it translates that way. No, completely. So before we go, we would love to just learn a little bit more about you. And so we have these four rapid fire questions that we are going to ask um, in hopes of, of learning more about you. So the first is, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self about love, sex, or relationships? Yeah. So I would have told my younger self to allow more of my like primal desire and how Mm. important like having that primal attraction is in relationship. So I think initially that Mm. felt like, oh, I shouldn't focus there. I have to focus on these like higher level things. And then yet (laughs) I would say, yes, focus on those things too. High quality character in your relationship and all of that. Uh And yet you need that primal attraction. Oh, yeah. That is solid advice. I think that goes back to the piece that I was saying about that the the couples that I see with sexless marriages, it's just, that's the piece they missed out on. That's the piece exactly. they ignored. Like, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. You fell in love with the person and it's beautiful and you never liked the way they smelled or touched. <laughs> right, like, right, 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 right. Exactly. Like your rational mind thought they would be a good partner. Right. But your your skin, your nervous... Your body- they didn't want them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Solid advice. Um, okay, what is one romantic or sexual adventure on your bucket list? Okay, I'm going to go with romantic. I'll save the naughty for my partners. But it sounds, <laughs> it sounds so cheesy. But ever since I was little, I've always wanted like someone to take me on a surprise air balloon ride. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and I can't tell you, I have... I have told all my partners this, it has not happened. So it's still like before I die, I want someone to do the like 
take me on a air balloon balloon ride adventure. And then maybe we get a little freaky in the air balloon ride. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yes, yes, yes. That's fantastic. Okay, Jessica, how do you challenge the status quo? Oh, yeah. I, that's a hard one. It's like, how do I not? <laughs> <Right>? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds like the right answer. Right? Like, I mean, but the newest way I'm challenging the status quo is moving to Costa Rica and I'm moved moving into this regenerative community where we're sort of looking at new alternative ways of living that sort of challenge mainstream individualism that challenge consumer sort of high carbon footprint ways of living. So that's the way I'm newly challenging the status quo. Yeah, it's moving into a regenerative lifestyle. That's amazing. Okay, uh, last but not least, what are you curious about lately? Yeah, I mean, that's another one. Like, what aren't I curious about? There's so (laughs) many things. There's so many things I'm constantly learning. And But I think the questions that I've been working with is like, what is actual true healing? And so even like physically, Mm. I have a lot of food allergies. Like, are these ever going to truly heal? Are they, am I just managing them? Right. So, Mm. and then with trauma, like what is true healing, right. Versus the management of the trauma. So I'm really looking at that, like, and there are modalities that say we can have it, but that's, that's what I've been interested in lately. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I can't wait for the book. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, once you find the answers, come back, please tell us. <laughs> yeah. this, is a, this is a great curiosity. Yeah. Amazing. Awesome. I wish we had much more time with you, but I appreciate all the time that you gave us. This was really fantastic. Again, go read the book, go get it, read it twice, get the audible. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks for joining yeah. us today. Thank you all so much. You're fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> You and I were so excited about this conversation. I think I mentioned this in the in the interview. The two things that you and I probably talk about the most, the most. <laughs> are attachment and non-monogamy. Yes. And like the marriage of it in this book was just ugh, incredible. Yes. And so there was like a thousand moments that mm-hmm. I love and wanted to do, you know, kind of sink my teeth into. But there were four things I think that stuck with me the most. The first is that idea that when we are experiencing jealousy or discomfort within our relationship, that we can ask ourselves, is this based on me, we, or society? Love that. I love that. Such a good, such a good question. So good. So good. So good. Yes. So succinctly put, me, we, or society. Going to absolutely use that moving forward. Another thing that that stuck with me that continues to, to just like settle into my soul is her description of attunement, Mm -hmm. which is the A in heart, and it being about being in it with you without taking it on. Mm -hmm. And I remember experiencing that in my conversations after the infidelity with my wife, where my pain was raw and I needed her to be an audience and support me in that. But that was really hard for her, right? Because she caused that pain. Mm -hmm. And that was something that we had to learn over time that she could be in it with me without necessarily taking it on. Mm -hmm. And so I just love that that definition of attunement. It really just, it did, that practice helped us to develop more safety in our relationship. So yes, 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 yes to that. Absolutely. I think it is that nuanced difference between attunement and enmeshment that Mm. we need to be super careful about. And the difference is essentially having good boundaries. Uh, It really boils down to that. And I think sometimes what feels like attunement is actually enmeshment is when we take it on rather than we hold space. It's really getting to that, you know, we call here ninja level and, and having good boundaries so you can be attuned without being enmeshed. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think even now I see that in arguments that when someone is sharing their pain with you and you may have be a part of contributing to that pain, some misunderstanding, miscommunication, and you start to feel yourself getting defensive, that Mm -hmm. means that you are taking that on as opposed to just being present in their feelings. And so Mm -hmm. that was just something that stuck with me again, that I was like, oh, I need to, I need to think more about this. Mm -hmm. I think the, the combining of the fuel gauge activity, which is something that we referenced and I talked more about in our last podcast episode, where essentially you really realize how full or empty you are in different areas of your life Mm -hmm. with the question around attachment needs and which ones Mm -hmm. are present right now. Again, I thought was brilliant. I mean, Mm -hmm. to ask, to be able to regularly check in in 
and say, right now I need more security or stability, or right now I need more freedom and spontaneity based Mm -hmm. on how you're feeling in in your attachment in that moment. I just think, yeah, loved it. Loved it, loved Mm -hmm. it. And then the last thing that again kind of sunk into me and I was like, ooh, it was that moment of like, oh, like both enlightened and a little sad because you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that Mm -hmm. is that all the things that we do to invest in our relationships, we also need to do for ourselves. So, you know, when she talked about heart and all the thing, all the components that are part of that, which are being here, expressing delight, being attuned, having rituals and routines and turning towards versus turning away from during conflict. And then at the end, she tied it up with the S and she's like, and that's how you practice secure attachment with yourself. I was like, Poosh. absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it really, the thing that I say probably too often, but I, I cannot um, emphasize enough is among the myriad of connections polyamory can provide, the most important of them all is the one with yourself. Mm. And I think it is, you know, I, in, there's also an argument that you can make that we are all, we should all consider ourselves polyamorous because we should always nurture a relationship with ourselves that mm-hmm. is as important as any other relationship with nurture with anybody else. So mm-hmm. that is not to say, this is not a, a poly preaching, but to just think about ourselves as important um, as any other relationship that we have and treat it and heal it and 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 thrive in it just like we would um, do the work for another relationship, I think is super important. So yes to that. That was a great, great moment. My takeaway is I actually loved that we talked about how attachment styles show up in our sexual experiences since a lot of the time attachment theory is discussed mostly on the relational side and we kind of just don't necessarily go into the the sexual experience, which is for a lot of people, though not everybody, as we learned from Angela, uh, Angela Tan, that is important. The sexual side of a relationship is important. And that people with secure attachment styles tend to be more likely to experiment, be more open about talking about sex, while people who are showing up as insecure, showing up as having insecure attachment systems in relationships, are more likely to have unwanted sex, um, sex too early, or be less willing to connect during sex and maybe make less eye contact or say nice things. So that this, our sexual experiences also uh, are governed by attachment styles. Also, I think that the, my other major takeaway is that all these factors that we talk about don't necessarily indicate an insecure attachment system, that mm-hmm. these behaviors can actually be the preferences of someone who is securely attached. So it really requires a, a deeper examination, a deeper look into the motivation, the intention um, within our behaviors and our, the way that we're choosing to connect with people. And I have to say, exploring our attachment styles and examining how they impact the way we love and connect are crucial in thriving relationships. Once again, if you haven't read the book, go read it. If you read it, share it with somebody else. It was just so interesting. I can't wait to actually dive into it again. Um, I want to do like a book club. Mm-hmm. I want to do a book club with my partners. Like mm-hmm. we need, <laughs> it just needs to be the new thing. We need mm-hmm. to be talking about, you know, healing our attachment styles and earn secure attachment. And just again, as a, as a parent, as a partner, as a human being, really great read. You can find out about Jessica Fern via her website, jessicafern.com. On there, you can access her webinars or join her newsletter so you can get updates about her work and a notification when her practice opens up to new clients. You can find Paula Secure on our website at wearecuriousfoxes.com forward slash reading list. While you're on our website, check out the blogs and articles that we have from educators, authors, and Effie and I about sex, tips for thriving in open and monogamous relationships, and resources for your personal growth. You also find links to our Instagram or our Facebook, which is We Are Curious Foxes. You can join the conversation about the podcast. For behind the scenes footage, mini episodes, and over 50 videos from educator led workshops, you can go to Patreon at We Are Curious Foxes. And you can support this work by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or following on Spotify and Stitcher. Send us a rating or comment to let us know that you're listening. And we want you to tell us about the podcast moments that have felt the most impactful or what topics you'd like us to explore. You can share that with us by emailing us or sending us a voice memo at listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. Or you can record a question for the show by calling us at 
870-0063. This episode is produced and edited by Nina Pollock, who provides us with a secure base and a safe haven so we can be fully self-expressed in every episode. Our intro music is composed by Dave Saha. We are so grateful for their work. And we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox Podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind. And we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. 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 Stay curious.